All right, we are officially broadcasting. Participants should begin rolling in. Awesome. Good. Numbers starting to uh, increase. We just started. So, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Josh. We'll let people begin flowing in uh, before we before we officially begin. But we appreciate everybody attending uh, our online weekly webinar. Very important topic today: paying for college. There's one aspect of getting in. What about what do you do after you get in? You must pay for it. Uh, but we'll let, unfortunately, 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 uh, but we will let the participants begin to flow in. Give everybody uh, one more minute. Yeah. Great. Okay. All right. Well, I think as uh, people funnel in, you know, they just kind of catch us as we begin. But thanks again, everybody, for attending our weekly online webinar. Uh, very happy to have Josh Bennett here, a certified financial planner, talking about the topic of how to pay for college the right way. A lot of people are eligible to receive some sort of a financial aid or assistance or be better positioned to pay for college. And uh, a lot of people do not recognize that maybe they have that ability. And hopefully today is a very illuminating topic and has a lot of valuable information for how uh, families can better plan for the financial aspect of college. And before uh, we hop into it, uh, we always like to just share with everybody a little bit more about uh, BEC, what we do. Uh, we know certain people in the audience have already told us they're our current clients, so thanks for coming. Uh, but a lot of people may be new. Uh, BEC education, we focus on the long-term development of students. That means really, you know, in addition to getting into college, what is your purpose while you're there? What are you trying to achieve for your future? And if we can help a student better understand that, through our mentor service, through our different services that we offer, then suddenly the planning we can provide can be a lot stronger and can make more sense for the student's future as well as give them more motivation to complete it because they have a stronger purpose themselves. And then by the time that they're applying to college, they have become the kind of student colleges want, as in they have a strong vision for themselves, what they want to accomplish, they have strong accomplishments, and then the story becomes a lot stronger of why they should attend that college that they so much want to attend. So. Uh, through our mentor consulting services, through our application consulting services, and through tutoring test prep, we try to support students uh, from all aspects that will make them successful. Uh, but one aspect which we cannot say is our specialty is the financial aspect, but that's why we uh, like to, you know, give the floor over to professionals who can speak more on the topics that they are, you know, so have such a rich background in. So I will hand the floor over to you, Josh, and we're yeah, looking forward. Awesome, Jonathan, thanks for the introduction. Yeah, so my name's Josh Bennett. I'm a certified financial planner and owner of Vincere Wealth Management. So we do basically comprehensive financial planning for families, which ultimately a huge part of that is obviously college because one of your three biggest expenses in life is essentially retirement, college, and taxes. So um, that naturally became a big focus of ours. And so yeah, so we, we work with a lot of families to figure out all the nuances with paying for college and just kind of how to navigate that whole process. Um, so got a lot of information for you today and just kind of how to think about paying for college, what the financial aid process looks like if you qualify, um, and just kind of give you some nuggets in terms of how to lower the cost of college. So like one important takeaway from this whole conversation is that the, the sticker price of college is essentially a suggested price. Most people think that you kind of have to pay that price. And realistically, it's just a suggestion. Like there's a lot of ways to lower the price. There's a lot of ways to get help. Uh, and so that's some of the things we're going to talk through. Uh, Jonathan, you mind hit the next button. All right. So the whole college process has several different steps to it, but most people sort of focus on just the financial aid piece of the puzzle, but there's actually a lot of other ancillary pieces to the whole financial aid process and um, paying for college process. So one of the first ones, and this is actually one of the ones where you can get the most value, which we'll talk through here in a minute, but it's actually creating the list of schools that you want to attend. And I know that's something that Jonathan helps out and his team helps out with a lot, um, but picking the right school can be a real value. Then from there, actually applying for school and filling out the right documents, such as like FAFSA and the CSS profile to be eligible for financial aid. And then once you actually get your offer, what most people don't realize is you can actually work with the schools to negotiate the price of admission essentially. So you can 
negotiate better grants and better scholarship offers. You can actually pin schools against each other. There's a lot you can do in terms of negotiation. But there's also a lot you can do in terms of working with your finances to lower the cost of college, um, just from your perspective, such as like getting tax benefits um, that can kind of lower the cost of college. But also, in addition to that, um, there's a lot of nuance in how you pay for college. So for example, and we're gonna get into this more here in just a second, but there's actually some nuance in how to take student loans even for college and to have higher or lower interest rate loans versus the higher interest rate loans and how you have to go about planning for that. So there's a lot of weird nuances. So you wanna have some of these things all planned in advance. So that's a little high level overview of the process that we're gonna kind of dig through through this uh, presentation. Next. So this could, should come as no surprise to anybody here, but college in the US is expensive and it's only getting more expensive. So the average cost of college for a public four-year school here is about twenty-five dollars to $26,000 per year. Um, and that's just basically an out-of-state tuition on average. So you're looking, if you're looking to go to say like a University of Georgia, University of Indiana, University of Colorado, any of the big like state schools, um, and that's, somewhat excluding California, unfortunately, a lot of them will be in that kind of $25,000 range. Once you get to some of the private nonprofit colleges, um, you're gonna be more in the range of about $50,000 per year. And that's sort of your average private school. Uh, when you get into some of the higher tier private schools like the you know, Stanford's, Yale's, Harvard's, Brown's, those can even get into the 70s and $80,000 per year. So you could be looking upwards of three hundred to three hundred fifty thousand dollars for a four-year college education, and if you have three kids going through college, that could be almost a million dollars, if not even more than a million dollars. So obviously, this is a huge expense. And right now, I mean, COVID aside, college expenses are on the rise. So, uh, Jonathan, if you'll click next. Each year college and prices have been inflating about four to six percent per year. So the sticker price right now, is not gonna be the sticker price that college will be once you end up graduating or your student ends up graduating. So for example, say you have two children, one may be a junior or senior now, but you may have a child that's more in, you know, say the 10th grade or sixth grade that are, you know, have maybe five, six years till they're looking at college. Well, by the time they hit school, the cost could be significantly higher, as you can see kind of from these numbers. So it's definitely on the rise. Um, we might see some changes now with schools kind of looking more towards online, but right now that's sort of out in the open. No one really necessarily knows. We might see it change a little bit or at least sort of flatten a little bit. But again, no one really knows right now. The expectations are that this fall might not be quite business as usual, but it should be business as usual in the near future. Next. And some important thing to know when thinking through paying for the expense of college. So, I mean, a lot of families see that kind of $1 million price tag and uh, student loans kind of jump into mind as like a easy solution for how to pay for it. And that's why we actually see in the U.S. we have about one. And actually, the funny thing is I, I made this PowerPoint a couple, like a week or two ago, like I edited it, edited it. And the student loan debt in the U.S. was about 1.64 trillion. As of today, it was about 1.67 trillion already. So it's increasing drastically at a really fast pace. So right now, it's increasing by about $3,000 per second in terms of student loan debt in the country, which we're, I'm gonna go through why that's a problem here in just a second, but realistically, this is what families have been sort of relying on and like it, it didn't used to be a, a problem until the cost of college just went shot up. And now like it's you know hard for families to just shell out a million dollars for three students if they're you know also trying to retire or may have their equity tied up in houses or businesses. It can just be hard to shell out that money. So student loans are, are a easy fix, which but you might not necessarily want to go that route just because like right now in the US, average student loan debt's about thirty thousand dollars coming out of school. But that's the average. There's a lot, a lot of people that graduate with no debt, but there's a lot of people, as I'm sure you've heard the stories, graduating with well into the six figures in terms of debt. And to put that in perspective, uh, average like student loan payment is going to be about $100 for every 10,000 in student loan debt. 
So if you have say $100,000 in student loan debt, you're gonna be having about a $1,000 monthly payment, which average uh, salary for a student out of college is only about $50,000. So if you have a $50,000 salary trying to pay San Francisco rent and also making a $1,000 student loan payment, it becomes very challenging. And that's why you see a lot of students now moving back in with parents until well into their late 20s or 30s, um, just being able to make ends meet while their salaries increase. Um, so it's a, it's a big problem taking out student loans. And so I like to have this kind of as an air of caution before you take them out. Next. So the other thing to think about too um, is when you're going into thinking about your school and um, going to college, obviously one of the things that you're wanting, you should be wanting to consider is that college is an investment. So you're investing in your child's future. You're investing in their future career prospects. You're investing in their future salary. You're about, so it's like an investment. So no different than any stock or mutual fund that you would invest in. You want to get a return on that investment. You want to try to get the best return on investment possible. And one thing to consider is that not every major is created equal. So this should come as no surprise that different majors will command different salaries out of school. So you really want to consider that when thinking through your college education. And I'll kind of give you an example here on the next slide that shows that why that is. Jonathan, you mind? Next. Thank you. So to put this as a prime example, so if we look at education majors, so from the last slide, you may have seen that edu average education major is about 34,000 graduating salary uh, in the US. Well, if you look at sort of the return on investment of an education, it's not necessarily just purely about the school. Obviously the school is an important part, but for example, you look at University of Wisconsin, which is ranked fourth in the country for their education major, uh, according to US News, uh, the average state out-of-state tuition for that is about $24,000, when most likely because of the quality of the education program, they're likely to demand one of the higher salaries coming out of that program for a teacher, where if you look at Stanford, obviously no one could argue that Stanford's a, you know, one of the best schools out there, but when it comes to their education major, they're uh, ranked 11th, which is well behind uh, University of Wisconsin. Yet Stanford costs about $52,000 per year. So when you look at the difference in price, ultimately the salary and prospects out of school may be you know, pretty much equal across the board. If not, maybe even slightly skewed towards University of Wisconsin, but you'd be paying a lot more to get that same level of investment in your education long-term. So this is something I'm sure Jonathan would go through and his team would go through with you to choose, make sure you're choosing the right program within the school, but you wanna also factor in, is this the right program at the right, right cost, in my opinion. Um, so next. Um, so once you've kind of taken a look at, okay, here's the school I wanna to go to, it then becomes about, how do we pay for this? So the first thing to do is kind of create your budget for a school so that one, you make sure you know if the school is affordable, are you going to be able to pay for it without disrupting your retirement or disrupting just your, your lifestyle and things like that. Um, and so there's a couple different buckets to look for when it comes to kind of categorizing your resources that you have available for college. One of them is parent resources. So these are the that's it's coming from the parents, which typically are like 529 savings, which even if they're in the student student's name for financial aid purposes and things like that, they're actually counted as parent assets. So 529 savings, which uh, if you're not familiar, 529 plan is basically a education savings account that's geared directly for education purposes, but has a lot of tax incentives around saving for college in that plan. So it works kind of like a retirement account, but for education. Other assets that may just be like investments, savings accounts, things like that. Um, there's the American Opportunity Tax Credit. Depending on what your income level is, you may qualify for the Opportunity Tax Credit. Uh, and we're going to get into that here in a little bit. But um, it's one of those interesting tax credits where there's some nuance in terms of how you pay for it. Um, 
The other parent resource, which is often, often overlooked, is cash flow. So most people think that just because the college will say at the start of a semester, hey, give us our bill for the semester, that you have to pay it in that one lump sum. You actually don't. You, most schools, at least every school I've ever come across, has a monthly payment option. And generally, they're at zero interest, so you can just basically request to pay monthly. And then what you do is, like right now, by having your child under your own roof, you're still paying for them. So you're, whether you're paying for food, electricity, activities, you name it. So you're paying for, for them out of your cash flow right now. So by doing this, all you're doing is extending that cash flow and paying for your child through college. Um, so if you're paying like $400 a month, you just kind of continue paying that $400 a month, even though they move out and you're saving that in your own household, you just now move that to your college expenses. So most people don't know that you can do that, but it's definitely a valuable resource. Um, if nothing else, just so you don't have to pay in one lump sum. Grandparent assets. So this is pretty common if a grandparent wants to chip in. There's ways to go about that that could, um, so well, let me back up. So for grandparent assets, you want to be careful because depending on how the grandparent pays for the education or adds to it, it could actually impact your ability to get financial aid. So you really want to be careful with grandparent assets. And usually you want to basically wait till later in their four years to actually pay or get receive grandparent help. Um, so student resources, these are savings accounts, custodial accounts, or cash flow from like a uh, student job. And then student loans is one of the ones we just went over. Um, and kind of go over here a little bit more in just a second. But student resources, just as a heads up, and we'll kind of go through this a little bit more, but student resources are impacted the most when it comes to receiving financial aid. So if you can kind of minimize the amount that's in your student's name, it's gonna make it better for your chances to get need-based financial aid. Next. So there's three different types of student loans, or at least for the most part. So, and I, I like to highlight this just because I think this is an important nuance when it comes to planning for college, especially if you're gonna take out student loans. So there's what are called federal direct Stafford loans. So these are student loans that are essentially government subsidized in a way, or at least government mandated. So you have subsidized and unsubsidized. The subsidized version basically just means you don't have to pay interest until after college. Uh, the unsubsidized just means it starts accruing immediately. However, these tend to be the best out there in terms of your interest rate. So they're going to be the lowest interest rate you can generally find for uh, student loans. So a weird nuance with these, though, is that they're use it or lose it each year. So what a lot of families will do is pay for college, you know, say they have some 529 savings or just other savings in that they'll pay the first one, two, three years um, just paying for like out of their savings and then take student loans out their fourth year. But at that point, you can only get 7,500 of the best interest rate loans. So you actually want to be systematic about how you take out student loans if you know you're going to need them. So for example, with Stafford, you can get take out 5,500 first year, 6,500 second year, 7,500, 7,500. So then you have your uh, parent plus loans. So those are basically the loans that are in the parent's name, um, which you can be basically, you can borrow up to the full cost of attendance. They're better than a lot of private loans that you'll um, see out there. They're still not great in terms of interest rates. Uh, then you have private student loans, typically don't have great interest rates. And downside of private student loans is banks are very generous and they're very easy to get because they're essentially unbankruptable, meaning they're going to pretty much, you either have to pay them off or you're going to die with them. And then you're even likely going to have, like if you pass away with a student loan, likely your loved ones will basically have to pay off that debt. So they're very, very sticky and hard to get rid of regardless of what happens um, post-college in terms of your financial situation. So I, I really hesitate and urge people to be very careful taking out private student loans. Next. And I have one uh, question uh, from the audience, uh, if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, 
all very good information so far. We have a question though. Do FA financial aid officers look at a student's retirement account, perhaps, I mean, a parent's retirement account, such as traditional IRA or Roth IRA? Nope, they do not. Actually, we're gonna get at it more here in just a second, but um, yeah, essentially retirement accounts are, are protected. So they're not gonna, gonna, and actually that's a big mistake parents often make on the FAFSA form is adding in retirement accounts. So mm -hmm. you don't necessarily need to. So make sure you add in like, so the ones that are gonna count against you are like the, the taxable assets. So savings account, okay. brokerage accounts, those sorts of things. Okay, well, great question and great answer. Okay, well, let's Good keep question. going. Do you wanna move on to the next slide? Perfect, thank you. Um, and so part of these, like all accounts I was talking about, they're not all created equal, just like, you know, the majors I was talking about. Each type, different type of savings account for college has its own pros and cons. Like, for example, some will have, be more tax efficient, some will be more investment flexible. Like a 529 plan is going to be pretty tax efficient or very tax efficient, but you're not going to have many investment options in there. Um, same with like, for example, a custodial account is going to be very financial aid and inefficient, but you're going to have a lot of investment flex flexibility. So as you're kind of thinking through all these different assets and ways to pay for college, you really want to kind of think through which ones make the most sense for my family. Um, and, and do I want investment flexibility? Do I want the tax benefits? Um, do I want the ability to pass or use this for something other than education? So for example, the Coverdell Education Savings Account and 529 both have to be used for qualified education purposes, meaning they have to go towards like tuition, room and board, things like that. They, and they're, you know, if you don't end up using them for that, so say your student gets a full ride or gets an athletic scholarship or anything like that, then you may have trouble getting that money out of the 529 without paying a tax penalty. Um, you can pass it to siblings or to other immediate family, but that's about all you can do with it. So you can't necessarily take it out uh, for other purposes unless um, you hit, take that penalty and pay the taxes. Um, whereas like a taxable investment account can be used for anything, it can be used for education or say your student gets a full ride and you wanna pay for a down payment on the house as a reward when they get out of college. You have the full flexibility to do that. So thinking through the different accounts and how you wanna pay for it strategically, um, but you want to look at all these different factors and make sure what it's best for your family. Next. And so here's how you put all this stuff together. So this is kind of how you put this financial, like this budget for school together. You in inventory all these different assets and just essentially say, okay, here's the parent resources I have. Here's the parent loans that we are going to look to get. Here's the, my, the savings of my student's name, um, the loans, et cetera. And then you can, ultimately take that sticker price of college, plan it into a budget with each four years. And then this is where it gets a little tricky is you wanna make sure you kind of figure out how you're gonna pay for all four years down to the penny ahead of time, just so you don't get into those situations like I was mentioning with the Stafford loans. So you wanna sort of be strategic. And another weird loophole is, for example, say you have a lot of assets in a 529, but you qualify for that American Opportunities Tax Credit. So how that American Opportunities Tax Credit works is you have to spend $4,000 from essentially taxable income towards college to get that $2,500 tax deduction. So if you spend everything from a 529, that's not a taxable account, so you're gonna lose out on that tax deduction. So that's a weird kind of nuance that will essentially, could essentially cost you $2,500 if you didn't know that. Um, same with the student loans. Uh, not planning ahead could cost you that $5,500 loan with a better interest rate. Um, another weird thing is like, if you are going to qualify for financial aid and you're getting grandparent help, I didn't necessarily do it in this example, but if a grandparent were to say gift money to a 529 or gift money to a student, it could show up in the student's income as income for that year, which could ruin their chance of getting financial aid. So generally you want to save grandparent help till later um, when you're not necessarily applying for FAFSA or CSS profile anymore. So for example, uh, a strategy may be to 
um, have them pay, you know, contribute to year four or pay off some student loans after college, things like that. Next. So there's two, when you're kind of thinking about financial aid, there's really two types of financial aid. So there's need-based aid, which uh, I'll show you kind of how that's factored here on the next slide. But basically, need-based aid is factored on the family's resources and their overall ability to pay for school. It has no factors in terms of you know, athletic ability or GPA. None of that's factored in to need-based aid. It's purely financial. You then have merit-based aid, which is that's all the qualifications of the students. So that's where you get like the scholarships like athletic scholarships or academic scholarships or um, any other scholarship that's based on, you know, their ability to achieve something. Um, so you have need-based aid and merit-based aid. Merit-based aid is also not going to be factored in, like none of, the, none of your financials are going to really be factored in in the issuance of merit-based aid. Um, something to know with the like these two types of aid is not all schools will provide both. So for example, when we look at a school like the Ivy Leagues, like the Ivy Leagues are what we call 100% need met. So a school like Harvard is never going to turn down a student because of finan finances, because their, their central play is that they want to get qualified students in the door who go off and make millions through their career and then donate back to their endowments. So they'll never turn away a student for a hundred grand. So they'll meet a hundred percent of a family's need to come to college. However, at the Ivy Leagues, when it comes to financial aid, there are no special snowflakes. There are no merit scholarships. So they only do need-based financial aid. They will not do merit-based. So that's another thing to factor in where like, for example, a way they could easily lower the sticker price of school and still get a great education would be to consider a top tier um, like honors program at a school that does give merit-based aid versus say a, an Ivy League. Um, so where you're still gonna get a great education, you can maybe get an ed greater, a great education just at a lower price because of that merit-based aid. Next. So the two forms that you'll need for uh, getting uh, any financial aid both merit or uh, need-based is you'll need to fill out what's called the FAFSA, which is the free application for federal student aid in the CSS profile. So, which is the College Scholarship Services profile form. So these two forms are a little different just because, so the FAFSA, every college requires. So you have to fill that out pretty much regardless of the school you want to attend. CSS profile, this is essentially demanded by about 400 private schools. So these are usually your, your top tier private schools that um, use the CSS profile. So for, I'm imagining a lot of the students that are in, on this call right now, likely you'll need to uh, fill out the CSS profile. Next. So these are the different calculations in terms of how do you can essentially determine how you can get financial aid or what your financial aid could look like. So the, so the first thing is what's called, you'll see it all, all the time on these forms is the, the COA. So this is the cost of attendance. So this is also the, the sticker price. So this is what the colleges will advertise on their website as what their tuition and room and board costs are. You'll have the, your EFC, which is your expected family contribution. So what that is, is when you fill out the FAFSA form, for example, those assets, income, and you know, resources that you have will be factored in and you'll, from there, they'll calculate what your expected family contribution will be. So for example, the factors are your taxable assets, both student and parents. So student assets are counted very heavily. So basically every 50 cents on the dollar that is in the student's name is expected that they're going to pay towards college, fair or not. Um, the parents' assets are calculated about 5% is expected to go to college. So that's one big factor when you're considering financial aid is, and that's why I mentioned earlier that you want a lot of this stuff in the parents' name just so that way you have the best chance of getting financial aid. Um, income is also a factor both on the parents' income and the student's income. Again, student's income is 
quote unquote taxed more heavily when it comes to financial aid. Um, parents' assets are still ta taxed pretty heavily, but not as bad as the students. Um, so like for the parent, it could be anywhere from about 20 to 40% of your income, depending on how much your income is, could be factored against you for financial aid. So all, all of this, they basically take into account to factor in what is my family's expected contribution? How much can my, me as a family be able to pay towards school? So that's what the EFC is. And then so to get your financial need, it's basically, all right, here's the sticker price of the school. So we'll call it 200,000. The college may determine that you have $100,000 that you can uh, contribute to this education. So there's a $100,000 difference. That's your financial need. And then so financial need is just basically how much need-based financial aid you're eligible for. Um, so like a school again like Harvard that meets 100% of financial need would basically give you $100,000 in terms of grants and scholarships to be able to attend. Um, so all this is determined by your prior prior year's tax form. So for example, students going into uh, school in 2021, they'll be using 2019's tax forms. So uh, it's not necessarily like you won't have to use 2020's tax forms for all this. It'll be based on 2019's. Uh, next. Okay, uh, very good. We have one uh, more yeah. question, if you don't mind. It's a good yeah, question. Uh, it's an interesting point about the student's income. Uh, some people overlook that or do not know that's a factor. Uh, the question is, do financial aid officers really look into the student's bank accounts? I guess your short answer is yes, but can you, can you expand on it a little bit? Uh, so, I mean, it is basically you self-declare right. the student assets. Um, so, I mean, theoretically, they, I, I mean, they could find out. Um, so when, whenever you fill out the forms, you have to attest that everything was filled out. Mm. You know? Right. I mean, that's, and frankly, if, if you don't, that's where you kind of get into those situations that, um, you know, made that the news of about what a year ago with like the Hollywood stars that were mm -hmm. kind of finagling a lot of the stuff. Um, like, so those are typical situations. I mean, yeah, they, they, the schools have the ability to pull your tax forms and things like that. Um, but yeah, they don't really necessarily, to my knowledge, have any way of confirming mm -hmm. uh, student assets. Okay. Okay. Understood. I just wanted to address the question. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that they have their ways if something just doesn't add up and they can, can and will look into it, but um, mm -hmm. sure. Like I've definitely seen situations where um, someone will say like a business is, which like a business is obviously sort of in the eye of the beholder to some extent. Like they'll say their business is worth one one thing on the FAFSA or CSS profile, and then yeah. the school will come back and just say, um, "Yeah, we saw your tax forms. You made a million dollars, but it, through your business, but you said it was worth a hundred thousand. This doesn't matter." Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, so things like that. Sure. Okay. I think this question actually led into another question, which is worth addressing. Uh, what are considered assets under a student? Can you give some examples? Yeah. So savings accounts, like bank accounts, investments. So with that, obviously, depending on the age of the student, if they're under 18, that would be like a custodial account. Um, so basically assets that are like a custodial account here is essentially where a parent may be the custodian, like Right. Acting on behalf of the student, but mm -hmm. typically it is the, in the student's name. So that would be assets in the student's name. Um, it could be a trust, depending on how the trust is structured, could be in the student's name. Um, it could be, yeah, savings accounts in the student's name. Those ones are you sure. know, blatant. Um, even though, like, the one to be careful of are uh, joint ones. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. students and the parent are in, on the account, it's considered student assets. So that's the one to be careful of. Right, right. The joint, the intention was to help the student, you know, just let them be on the account, right? But in this case, it actually ends up hurting them because therefore it's considered the student side rather than parent side. Well, in fact, of course, it's really just the parent's money or asset, so. Yeah, know. exactly. So um, for the most part, I mean, it tends to be pretty self-explanatory. If it's, if it's assets that are for the benefit of the student, um, yeah likely unless it's just in the parent's name likely it's going to be considered student assets mm -hmm. okay okay great 
great. I think that. Aside, aside from the caveat is obviously retirement accounts and that goes for both parents and students. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Last one to keep on this topic. What about a family living trust? Getting technical here. If, if it's in the parents names, like the parents are the trustees, it should be the parents assets, but would, would count as the parents assets. Okay. Within the parents name, it would be the parents assets. Yeah, ultimately, and this trusts get a little complicated and it's hard to say without specifically looking at the trust, um, sure. but likely if it, it's ultimately, the schools will look at it as who's the beneficiary of that money. So mm -hmm. for example, if a trust, like you can set up all sorts of different beneficiaries, simple and complex, if it's benefiting the parents right now, as of today, then it's going to be considered parents. If it's benefiting the student as of today, like for example, like there's different educational trusts and things like that, or say a parent passed away or a family member passed away and the student's benefiting from that income right now. I understand. That's, that's where it's, it's basically so, who, whose money is it today, essentially. So if the trust is for 25 years old, it gets released, then that would be parent because the student's not 25 yet. Uh, no, that would be student. That would be student, okay, because they will eventually be the beneficiary. Okay, I just wanted to right. But unless it's like it is like the parents are using the money now no, I'm just, yeah. typically when you see those it's for the student just kind of deferred sure sure i think for this uh, situation definitely we got you know that's when we got to move into the consultation we got to see the documents but yes, this exactly. is a good catch-all answer for sure good question. Exactly. okay all right thank you i think those are the uh questions for now yeah continue thank you. uh yeah something i do want to mention though before um before we move forward yeah. Some of the factor, especially in California, this, you know, whether it's fair or not, um, especially on the CSS profile, equity in your property is looked at as an asset. Um, mm -hmm. So that can weed a lot of people out, especially in California, pretty quickly. Uh, mm -hmm. However, there are ways to essentially, uh, within the rules of the game, kind of finagle your house price down. Um, sure appraisal and yeah to as like minimal as possible so um like what, what's called i think the federal financial or federal housing index is generally the lowest i've seen in terms of kind of valuations um so but that's just something to consider yeah. i know it's a big problem in california but yes the idea is these things are complex uh don't try to go it alone you know you gotta you know this is serious stuff it's serious money it's worth uh you know pursuing seriously with a professional yeah yeah, I mean, the, the whole concept with all this is, you know, um, you, you wouldn't go into retirement or start a business without talking to a CPA or things like that. Like, you might as well. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's just as expensive and not even more expensive than some of those things. That's true. Very true. Okay, I'll let you. Yeah. Good. Um, yeah, so we already, so how to, from here, there's a lot of different strategies on how to lower the cost. So we kind of alluded to a lot of these, but your biggest ones, financial aid and um, getting those directly from the school is going to be your biggest powerhouse in terms of getting financial aid. And it's really, you know, having a list of schools and developing lists of schools that um, you know how generous they are, um, especially based on your students' qualifications is going to be really important just because, you know, for example, kind of going back to that uh, merit-based school with a great honors program may be willing to give a lot more money because they want to attract top tier talented students. And a lot of those type of schools, especially like a lot of state schools will have what are called uh, grid scholarships for merit. So, which basically mean like, you don't even have to necessarily do anything to qualify. You just have to essentially be able to fog a mirror and have a certain GPA and ACT score or SAT score. So, so for example, say you have a 1400 SAT and a 38 GPA that might automatically qualify you for a $30,000 scholarship. Yeah. So a lot of schools will have that where it's just basically meet these two criteria and we'll give you a lot of money. Um, and that's just sort of how they do it. Um, mm -hmm. And it's because they want to attract those top tier students um, because all colleges are businesses and they want to have the best stats and best represent representation out there. So knowing, knowing where you can get the most need-based or merit-based aid is gonna be really important. Sure. Um, so there's, you can also maximize aid with EFC reduction strategies. So that family contribution, there's a lot of things you can do by, you know, getting more of your income into retirement accounts, um, 
other things are like there's different types of investment accounts such as like uh, life insurance and things like that that can be really powerful to lower your your level of assets because for example like a life insurance policy like a whole life or universal life won't necessarily be factored in where a taxable investment account would be so there's different strategies obviously depending on your student it may not work for freshman year because of the prior prior year taxes but it could work for year two, three, four um, going in. Um, other strategies are like if you're debating starting a business or taking time off or anything like mm -hmm. that, any way that you can kind of lower your income on paper, yeah. uh, that's a, a great way to kind of lower that EFC and uh, boost your aid potential. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're a business owner, there's a lot of tax scholarships you can get. So one we already talked about was the American Opportunities Tax Credit. And that kind of applies to anybody. Um, as a business owner, you can do what's called income shifting, where you can essentially hire your kids into your business, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's just filing papers or something like that. And you can, depending on the income levels, so for example, you can give your student about $6,000 without it really impacting their financial aid or, or the taxation, things like that. So you can essentially get a $6,000 tax deduction each year where that right there saves you about $8,000 of taxable income that could then be shifted back to education. Mm. There's a lot of small things like that. And um, like if they're, if they're a member of the business, you can do like a lot of, there's like tax um, incentives for education where you can have offer like $5,500 of business expenses to go to education for your employee. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people have experienced this with their own companies paying or like mm -hmm. not corporate businesses paying for education. You can do that same thing as a business owner, like if you're like self-employed or run a small business. Um, so that's something to consider gifting assets. Um, so if you're like planning to gift assets, depending on how you do that, it could um, get income out of your name into um, a loved one's name um, and be able to do that in a, in a kind of different strategy. Like it, mm -hmm. in, for example, um, say like your student has some assets, but, or doesn't have any assets, you could right. shift some of your assets to your student. Cause like you're not, your students not always, like there's different thresholds basically. Um, mm -hmm. You could also, like I was mentioning earlier, have grandparents gift assets to help pay for tuition, things like that. So there's a lot of different strategies in terms of lowering the overall cost. The other one that I didn't put on here is negotiating. So when you actually get your aid, aid letters back and they say, okay, here's how much we're giving you um, in terms of need-based or merit-based aid or whatever the case may be, um, you can actually then, if you're not happy with it or disagree with it, you can write a letter to the organization or to the school and just say, hey, here's why I don't think this is right. You should be giving me more needed based aid. Or for example, say you apply to school to schools that are essentially competitors. So same kind of criteria, same level, if you will. Like this wouldn't necessarily work with like a Berkeley and a you know University of Colorado or something if you're kind of comparing, but it could work with like a Berkeley versus Stanford or something like that. You could mm -hmm. just say, hey, Berkeley gave me um, ten thousand dollars. You gave me five thousand dollars. You know, meet this, or I'm going to Berkeley. Um, just as like a, an example. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different strategies to lower the cost. These are, I mean, there's frankly too many to get into in a short time, but yeah, um, all the like the information's out there. Um, so the main takeaway is all like you should never pay the sticker price for school basically. So, mm -hmm. uh, and unless like even this is in, this is a rare scenario, but, uh, say you're, you know, thinking of only going to one school, one school only, um, and you don't get any need based aid and say it's a Stanford that doesn't give merit based aid. There are still even ways to lower the cost outside of that. So, if you're paying the sticker price, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> so just keep that in the back. Fair, fair lesson. <laughs> okay, very good. Well, yeah, thank you uh, so much, Josh. I think uh, this clarified a lot of points, uh, brought up a lot of new ideas for people maybe they hadn't thought of, and just kind of wanted to open up the floor to questions now in our audience. Uh, I know this, you know this is kind of complex stuff, and even some of the questions coming in can't be answered in a simple 
way, but we'd love to kind of get them down and try to address any concerns uh, people are having. Uh, those with students who maybe are about to attend, those uh, who have students who are about to apply, or maybe it's further down the line, so it's more about planning. Uh, we're very open to, uh, you know, questions. And of course, everybody who is here today uh, is eligible for a free 20 minute consultation with Josh. So it's a really great opportunity, uh, I think for everybody in the audience, you know, hopefully very, very useful. Of course, we like to say, if you don't believe us, you know, please follow the word of our students, our parents. We, we do maintain five stars on Yelp. Um, maybe it'll change for now, it's still five. So we appreciate any, uh, you know, good feedback, but also we really hope to be able to help more people. Uh, okay, we do have a question coming in. Uh, mm -hmm. This interesting one. What about uh, rental property income? I assume income uh, is that factored into the finances? Uh, both income and the assets can be yes. Okay, so you're saying if you, you know you own the property, that could be one portion, and then the actual monthly income that's received is also uh, would be calculated. Okay, so that would be uh, that's a good good question. Yeah, yeah, great question. I mean, so it's based basically. Uh, when it comes to income, it's really pulled from like, what's your AGI? So your adjusted gross income on like the US 1040, like that's, which I think is a lot line like 11B, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Uh, that's that basically that number, that's kind of what they're factoring in. And they'll even, if you contribute it to a retirement account, the schools will kind of add back that 401k contribution in there to kind of get a better even estimate of Hey, could that 401k money be diverted to college? Right, right. So, uh, so yeah, def definitely on the rental income and assets. That one's included. Uh, okay, we do have another one. Um, where can you find financial aid information before you put together the college list? So most schools will have uh, a net cost calculator on right. the website. Um, so. And there's a lot, there's a lot of different websites out there now that'll, um, you know, give, give you a sort of an estimation um, of what your like net costs are could be. Right. Um, so yeah, then that, that's, I mean, that's one way and that's like, so, so I mean, too, with like the free 20 minute consultation, usually what I do as part of that is get an idea of some of the schools that you're looking at and um, through the software I use, I can actually give you a general idea of how much of the need is met. Um, and give you like, some of the insights in terms of like the financial aid of that school, mm -hmm. is, it generous, is it not? Like what, what would you likely be paying out of pocket? Um, so it sounds like the short answer is talk to Josh. <laughs> <laughs> if you want the real answer. Otherwise, sure, the, the college websites themselves have a general cost calculator or other sites can guide you a little bit. But in the end, every, every family's financial situation is highly individualized. Yeah, exactly. That's and that's one of the hard things about this is it's hard to say exactly, but um, yeah, moral of the story is like every website will have a net cost calculator. Mm. How accurate they are, you know, who knows? But um, I, I personally don't think they're extremely accurate, but they're probably better than than nothing. Yeah, I totally understand. Well, here's a, another question, and this is perhaps representative of some other people in our audience. They say we are new immigrants from China. We don't have income in the U.S., but we do have money in a savings account and presumably, although not written, perhaps own property. Uh, do we have the chance to lower costs? You do. Um, so the one factor is for the FAFSA, um, you do have to be either essentially a permanent resident to sure. um, get, get the benefits. Um, so, I mean, that being said, for like merit-based aid and things like that and some of the other strategies. Um, and if your income and things in the US aren't necessarily, if that's something you may have down the road, you can reapply for financial aid each year. So if you might not be eligible for it right now, you may, may be eligible for it in the future, if that makes sense. So um, whether that's based on immigration status or based on just taxable income, things like that, uh, you may be eligible long term. That being said, actually, since even though you can't necessarily get FAFSA in the U.S. unless you're uh, a permanent resident, yeah. most countries have a similar program for going abroad, where you can still get financial aid through your home country for going abroad. 
Sure. And, to and to clarify, uh, they are green card holders. So Correct. you're saying that they, they would be eligible. I mean, depending upon strategy and the amount is dependent on the situation, but as a green card holder, they are equally eligible as a citizen. Yep, yep, exactly. Great, okay, hopefully that, that is helpful. So yeah, very, very good question. Okay, fantastic. Uh, we're gonna see if there's any uh, more. Oh, okay, okay, one more, one more. Uh, strategies for negotiation. How do you pit these schools against each other? Any tips, any tricks? Is it, you know, shoot them an email? What, you know, tell us more. Yeah, I mean, the, the easiest way is um, generally writing a, a well thought out letter. Um, right. Yeah. And, you know, obviously. Um, so it, it ten, tends to, it depends on like kind of what the situation is. Um, so, yeah, it could be pitting the school against each other. So, for example, like with a competitive school, um, especially if your student is um, a high merit student. So, yeah. for example, you know, has just a you know, perfect GPA, high test scores, athlete, things like that. Um, like for for example, um, like my, myself, especially like I, I wasn't the best student in high school. I didn't get serious until college. But I was a very good athlete in high school, and that's what got me into a lot of the schools I went to. But I actually was able, even myself, to kind of pit schools against each other because they wanted me to swim for them. So, mm -hmm. for example, I got full ride academic scholarships to schools I should not have gotten any academic scholarships for, but it's just because they didn't offer athletic scholarships. Yeah. So, having different things like that, where you, uh, if your student's an athlete, using, you know, working with coaches to try and get more financial aid. Um, if your student's just an amazing student, those schools will want to boost their stats. So if you have high test scores and high GPAs, they're gonna wanna advertise like, hey, we have these, this many people that have a 4.0 GPA. So they're gonna be willing to negotiate with you. So sending them a letter saying like, again, kind of, Berkeley gave us this offer. We just wanted to know if you'd reconsider because we'd really like to go yeah. to the school. Here's my story, blah, blah. Um, that can be one strategy. Another is like, for example, say a school is going to make an interpretation when it comes to need-based aid on things like businesses, like privately owned businesses, real estate, things like that. Um, they're their interpretation you may not agree with and other schools may not agree with them. So you can write and basically clarify why you think their need-based gift was wrong right. uh, and kind of just plead your case. So that can be another way. Um, yeah, there's a lot of different ways that will ultimately depend on kind of your situation, your students qualifications, things like that. Definitely. It's uh, definitely highly specific, but I guess the key is uh, once you get in, then suddenly you have a little power on your side, and especially when you get in multiple places, uh, where you're getting aid at at least one of those places, then suddenly uh, you, you're beginning to have leverage. Um, yeah. Actually, sorry, John, that's something I want to add on there oh, too. Sure. Especially if you're considering like right now a private school, um, like especially not one that may not be as highly funded. Like the Ivy Leagues, frankly, are, I mean, they have so much cash, they're never going to be worried about COVID. Um, or like the current situation, but there are a lot of really good private schools right now that may just not be as well funded because they may be newer schools or just not have the $50 billion endowments. Those schools will want to get good paying students in and good qualified students in, um, if nothing else, just to make sure they stay afloat. So you may not get down to zero with those schools, but you may have a lot of negotiation power when it comes to it because they, they want that tuition money. So for sure. And, yeah, no, it's true. Uh, finances are a bigger part of the college decision from the college side uh, more than ever. Now, of course, from student side, always important, but from college side, suddenly it's become a lot more important for sure. Yep. Yeah. The big, biggest thing of things, colleges are a business, um, and except for like the state run schools that just have state money. Any private school, college is, is a business ultimately, and so they're, they're willing to negotiate. They'll they'll be willing to play the game, you know. So good. All right. Well, very good. Uh, I think that's all the questions, uh, which were great questions. And thank you again, Josh. Thank you, everyone. Our audience will be, you know, getting this up on our social media. We'll make sure everybody, you know, has access to this. But yeah, thank you to everybody. And any last words, Josh? I think that's it. I mean. Yeah, you know, and one thing I just urge is, you know, 
take take the planning seriously. I mean, it could could save you a lot of money, or I guess prevent you from making a lot of mistakes that cost you more money. Um, yeah. So yeah, plan ahead. That's the best thing you can do. Um, and yeah, and like I said, take take advantage of that free twenty minute consultation. Happy oh. to help any way I can. Yeah, fantastic. We'd say the only mistake is not planning, is not trying to plan for sure. All right, well, thank you again. And I guess everyone have a good night for those, you know, maybe abroad and then have a good day. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Jonathan. Bye-bye.